hi to anyone who just arrived. We're going to get started slowly, so thanks for joining. Um, today we're going to hear about one of the least favorite topics of many out there. And that is time tracking. <laughs> Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Maria. And here with me today is Marcel Piripa. Did I say that right? You did. You nailed it. Nicely done. I did some French, yeah, <laughs> from Parakeeto. Um, I was assuming that your last name is French. <laughs> it is, yes. You also right. nailed that. Um, Marcel, do you have, uh, I mean, you have such extensive uh, experience working with digital agencies, uh, but for those of you who may, for, for those of you who may not know Marcel yet, please tell us a bit about yourself and Parakeeto. Sure. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for having me, Maria, and, and the whole team at Productive for putting this on. And thank you, everyone, for being here so close to the holidays. I'm sure everyone has lots going on trying to get into the new year. Um, as you mentioned, I run a company called Parakeeto, and we're a technology and consulting firm dedicated to one mission, which is to help agencies measure and improve their profitability. And we do that by really bringing together information from finance, from operations, and from sales into a framework that can easily help stakeholders answer the most important questions that they answer every day. We've been doing this for about five years and have helped hundreds of agencies with measuring their profitability and have installed time tracking in dozens of agencies over the years uh, successfully and in a way that actually, um, you know, their team doesn't hate. So hopefully we can dig into how we've done that and answer some of the questions that many of you I'm sure are wondering about when it comes to this very controversial topic. <laughs> Thanks. Um, before we get started, I'll just give you um, a quick background on Productive as well. For those of you who aren't using Productive yet or haven't heard about it, um, Productive is a leading business management tool for agencies. Uh, using the platform, uh, really agencies can run uh, many parts of their operations in it. So from biz dev, uh, uh, project management, budgeting, uh, reporting, billing, everything. So, um, of course, essentially there's time tracking underlying all those elements. And that brings us to our core subject for today. Um, Marcel, there are a lot of tactics, um, to improve time tracking compliance out there. So agencies will use anything and everything from gamification to giving out awards, reminders, and of course they'll switch from one time tracking tool to the, to the next. Um, what are the top reasons really agencies struggle with getting teammates to track time and how did you, how did you find a method that works? So, um, this is a great question and you've raised, I think one of the problems with how a lot of people think about time tracking and time tracking compliance, which is jumping straight into tactics, many of which can be very effective things like, you know, having a nice you know, beautiful to look at user experience in the product that you're using, having that time tracking close to where people are already working, trying to simplify the data schema, trying to help augment timesheets with things like device monitoring or resource planning. A lot of the great features that are present in a product like uh, Productive, for example. But what a lot of people forget to think about is the underlying thing that I have seen be the most impactful element to improving timesheet compliance, which is actually closing the loop between time tracking and the impact that it has on the people doing that time tracking. And I think this is best illustrated by a model here that I'll share and draw if I could. And I'm just going to pin myself just so everyone can see this. This is the framework that we really believe in as it relates to building agency profitability into the DNA of the company. It's what we call the agency profitability flywheel. And if you think about what agency operations is, it starts with number one estimates, right? And just as a fair warning to everyone, my handwriting is terrible, like really bad. And yes. it doesn't seem estimates, right? Es estimation. So assumptions about uh, client work or about projects and people. So that's where it kind of starts. If you think about agency operations, it's about taking those assumptions and trying to model them out into the future. And that's really how we start to look forward and make decisions about, should we sell this project? When can we start it? Should we hire people? Should we fire people? Are we on track to hit our goals? It starts with estimates. And then what we ideally are doing is we're measuring actuals. 
So we thought it was going to take this much time to do something. How much time did it actually take? We thought this team was going to be, you know, very busy. How busy were they actually? Did they spend a lot more time or a lot less time? Did we make as much money on this as we thought we were going to? And that set of feedback loops is critically important because, of course, our ability to look into the future and make sound decisions is going to be dependent on the accuracy of our estimates. So if we have no feedback loop between how close to reality those estimates are, then we're playing a dangerous game where we might be doing lots of planning, but that plan might be fundamentally flawed. So this is kind of the first critical element is we need to create this kind of data feedback loop. But the big mistake that people make is in the agency, they do two things that I think are really dangerous. The first is they try to infer reasoning from the data, right? They try to make their data feedback loop so precise, so detailed that they can look at a report and immediately understand what's happening and why. And I think that that's a huge mistake because we say this all the time at Parakeeto, the data can only tell you what the data is. Data can't tell you why the data is. I'll repeat that. Data can't tell you why the data is. It's just an objective measure of something that's happening. But a lot of times the way to get an understanding of the real root causes underneath is to actually have a conversation with people about this. So this is where we get into reports and meetings. And this is where the rubber meets the road. I want to ask everyone on the webinar, I don't know if you can interact with me in the chat, but if you can, how many of you actually take the information that you collect from time tracking and you sit down with your team and discuss it on a regular basis. Here are the projects that we did. Here's how much time we thought it was going to take. Here's how much time it actually took. Here's how utilized we thought we were going to be. Here's how utilized we actually were. And then you have a curiosity based conversation with the team about what can we learn from this? What went way better than we thought? And what can we extract from that? to apply to other areas of the business? What didn't go the way that we planned? And what do we need to learn from that in terms of how we estimate it, how we manage the client relationship, et cetera? This to me is the biggest reason that most agencies fail to have good time tracking compliance because they're doing this, but the team never sees or discusses or is involved in the decision-making that happens around the information. And so, they're left to their own devices to determine why they're tracking that time and how it's being used in the first place. And so ideally what happens when you have these reports and meetings is the team starts coming up with insights and ideas about, Hey, you know what? It seems like we're constantly going over budget on website projects. And there's a lot of friction between design and dev when we do the handoff, what are some ideas that we have about how to improve that? And we can start to make process improvements, which, should over time make our assumptions or our estimates more accurate, which should mean that when we plan to spend a certain amount of time on something, it, it is much more likely that it's gonna take that amount of time. That means less overtime, less weekend work, less you know stressful deadlines that are creeping up on us because we didn't anticipate things. We get a tighter feedback loop with actuals. And what this should mean is that we can plan better as an organization and everyone's better off for it. The business makes more money. The team has more stability and predictability. We're less likely to have to lay people off every time something goes poorly in the business or we lose a contract. And this feedback loop is what creates the buy-in. And I think the clarity on why time tracking is important and how it impacts people. So that to me, Maria, is like the number one thing. And if we get that right, all the other tactics that make time tracking easier uh, to get compliance on are going to be much more helpful because fundamentally we have buy-in at this level and understanding of why we're doing it in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, just, uh, I had a question in the Q and a, uh, that they're seeing my screen more than you. I, I tried to pin you and I think I have, but, um, was that, was that okay guys? Um, does anyone else want to re re see the, <laughs> Yeah, I should, I, it looks it looks like I'm pretty uh, spotlighted. You may need to stop sharing your screen though. That might be the problem while I'm doing this. Yeah, well, um, unless we want to, um, unless we want to do another run of it, um, and then you can share screens. Um, um, necessary. Yeah, and I can I'll share the slides after um, the presentation. But um, that's like the big thing, Maria. And then I have a couple of other things that I can talk about. The, the next thing I want to speak to here, and I'll, I'll share my screen. And if you want to unshare your screen, okay. I think that'll help. Everybody will be able to see a little bit better. I should be fully spotlighted. And by the way, if you're on the webinar, yeah, you want to make sure that you have the standard view turned on. 
Okay. So I think the now next thing. Applied multiple panelists can share uh, simultaneously. So I'm hoping that your screen can be shared. You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen the old fashioned way. And that should help do that. There, that should be better. Let me know everyone. If you can see that, that should be all right. Okay. So we talked about this first, which is the profitability flywheel. And actually I'll show you this version because the, <laughs> it's easier to read. So you have estimates and then you track actuals through time and cost tracking. Then you have reporting and feedback. Ideally you're closing the loop here. You're actually involving your team in this meeting cadence where you're actually having a conversation about the data so they can really understand why you're doing it and how it impacts them. And that's going to lead to process improvements. And this is the virtuous cycle, right? If you bake this into your business, then you should have profitability and scale over time because you'll constantly be identifying where are things not going the way that we want them to and recruiting the team to get involved in helping improve those things. So the next thing that we want to really focus on is the structure of our data in the time tracking tool. And I want to articulate something that I think is really important. Most of the time in a firm, when we're installing a new time tracking system, there's a project manager or somebody that's very operationally focused that's being tasked with making that thing real and implementing it. And the critical flaw that I see is that those people tend to value precision over accuracy, or worse yet, they conflate precision and accuracy as being the same thing or being inherently related. And the truth is when it comes to something like time tracking, precision usually comes at the cost of accuracy. And what I mean by that is if we try to track everything, we likely end up tracking nothing. A, because the data is so much more complicated, it's harder to actually get to the real important answers that we want because we have way too much metadata on a time entry. And it often is gonna hurt compliance because we're putting way too much friction and complexity and thinking into the process of tracking time. And at a fundamental level, the most important thing is to think about what questions are we trying to answer? And let's make sure that our time tracking data schema is aligned to answering those questions. So the simplest example that I can share with this is estimated versus actual time. And we see this all the time. It's insane how often we see this at Parakeeto where we have a client, a huge client, they're doing millions of dollars in revenue. They have a big team and they're trying to answer a really simple question, which is how much time did it take us to do this work relative to what we estimated when we started the project? And when we look at their estimate, it's structured like this. We have the client, we have the project, and then we have this many design hours. We have this many development hours. We have this many project management hours. That's how we're estimating the project. And then we go into their time tracking data and they have the client on a time entry. Great. We have the project. Okay, nice. We're doing well. And then they have 300 discrete tasks, none of which map back to a role. And so if we want to now answer the question of how much design time did it take relative to our estimate, we have to clean up all of this time tracking data and come up with some secondary heuristic to say, okay, well, what bucket does this belong into? It seems like an obvious thing, but it's an oversight we see constantly. And so that's really the first thing to think about is how do we estimate work? And let's make sure that whatever tool we're using to track time, we can create structural alignment. So there's no cleanup required in order to take a timesheet and compare it to the estimate. So we can get that answered immediately without having to do any kind of data cleanup or a secondary heuristic to restructure that data. And remember that complexity grows the more you try to become precise. And so keep things simple, right? Again, this is the, the fallacy of if we track everything, we'll have more accurate data, but cost and complexity will grow as you try to increase your insight across people and projects, across those two primary vectors. If you get to a place where you're trying to track the subtask within the milestone, within <laughs> the sub milestone, within the deliverable, within the project, like that's way too much detail. And so keep things simple and build complexity gradually over time, because I would rather have less precise data, but have really high compliance than have really precise data and have crappy compliance. The latter is not actually going to be insightful. Um, so I think those are kind of my, my top things that I'm going to share. I don't want to do too much structured stuff here because I sense there's good questions that we can answer directly from the audience. Yeah. Um, we're, um, do you want to save the questions for the Q&A at the end? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Now let me get back to screen sharing. Hopefully I can... 
Hopefully, I still know how to do this. Um, one moment, please. Okay, now that we've gone through your best practices, thank you, Marcel. I mean, if anyone has any questions regarding what you just went through, please feel free to you know either reach out later or you know we can ask during the Q and A, and then we could go through whatever else is needed. Um, now, in productive, um, I mean, as you said, like. Marcel, there are many ways to track time and, you know, people will use different tools, different methods in productive. There are actually six ways uh, from daily entries, uh, weekly timesheets, using the calendar sync function. Uh, you can start and stop a timer. Um, really, our team went like all out just to like make it as easy as possible for people to, you know, track time. And then we have like suggestions based on schedules, preferences and recent entries. Then lastly, you can also track time. Um, directly in a task that you're working on but um what's really key here is as you said like uh have conversations about the data uh right like what's happening um where it, where is it really that time going and why is that time going where it is going <laughs> so uh there are a few easy ways to pull that out of productive um a couple of things i'll just show you dashboards if you're not familiar with them um, it's a really neat thing where you can uh, set up like a customized dashboard uh, visually, however you want to show team reports, different reports in real time. This is just like a little mock-up here. Really, you can put together different things and share it with your team. So it's more or less clear when you're looking through, looking through it, right? Um, of course, you can you know have a meeting, talk about it and uh, clarify anything that needs to be clarified. The other thing is uh, Pulse, where you can set up here, I have like a a pulse that sell, uh, sends out sales tasks closed last week, but you can really, you know, set up a pulse to tell you anything. Um, it's an automated report that you can get delivered to your inbox. You can get delivered to Slack. Um, and really it's, it's great just because you don't have to think about it. Once it's set up, you, um, you just get it whenever, whenever, uh, you have it set up. So we have like Mondays. Um, then if you have any questions on this, please feel free to reach out. Um, I can, um, have my team, you know, elaborate on that. Um, but now like, let's get into the Q and a, we had some questions already lined up here. Um, and uh, like a typical question is, uh, should my non billable staff, so office mm -hmm. man, or maybe marketing, you know, you see, you know, they're not bringing in actual deals. Like, should they? track time as well. Yeah. Great question. I want to just encourage everyone to submit questions in the Q and a, I want to make sure that we get a lot of value out of this time. So the first question should non billable staff track their time. And the other question that's often, uh, related here is should the billable staff track their non billable time? And my answer is generally, especially if you're starting out or if you're struggling with time tracking compliance, no, it's by far the least important data set. Of course, the answer to that question always comes back to what are you trying to measure, but, and what framework do you use to measure the performance of your business? But with our framework, non-billable time is very unimportant. It is a bonus insight into where time is going internally, but the most important reason for us to track time is to understand the efficiency of our business at earning revenue. And so under that definition and under that framework, the only thing that we really need insight on is billable time or delivery time, time spent on client work. And I think this is actually um, one of the mistakes that I see people make is they think, well, how can we measure things like utilization or profitability if we're not tracking everyone's time? And usually that's because the way that they're measuring utilization is incorrect. They're measuring utilization based on how much of the tracked time was billable. But of course, that's not the right way to do it. You have to base that utilization metric on capacity, which you know, you're never going to get 100% time tracking compliance. And if you are, it's probably not going to be accurate. So if you really start to think about how each of the individual metrics are tracked, you start to realize that tracking internal time is not necessary for the core function of time tracking, which is to really understand the revenue earning efficiency of the business. So for most people, especially if you're struggling with this, I would say remove that requirement. It will only actually degrade your time tracking compliance and add additional friction that's not necessary and doesn't really add a whole lot of additional value. And how about like, here's a related question. Like how about um, like joining, joining those hours or that, that money spent invested into your overhead costs? Does that help? Yeah. 
<laughs> Great question. So we talked earlier about precision versus accuracy and doing allocations of salary to the profit and loss statement based on track time is one of the biggest precision traps I see agencies fall into. It seems like it's more accurate because of how precise it is, but it's actually far less accurate because let's talk through the real world scenario that we see all the time. You're having a really busy month. And so a lot of your team's time is being tracked to delivery work. And so you're allocating that to cost of goods sold, or you're allocating that to a delivery cost that's affecting your gross margin. That's great. And then the next month is slow. So what do you typically do when it's slow in the agency? Well, you take your billable staff that doesn't have much time to, you know, work on client stuff and you, you say, Hey, let work on the company website or, you know, create some social content for us or help out with these sales deals or, you know, go help uh, improve the productive uh, implementation and document some SOPs around that. And now all of a sudden you're going to funnel a bunch of their time into sales and marketing and administration. And it's going to look like your overhead costs were bloated for that month. But that's not real. That time is not a function. It's not a function of your operations as a business. It's a byproduct of utilization being poor. Utilization being poor should impact your gross margin. It should not impact your overhead costs. So it's a false. It's a false negative. That's a result of your methodology for allocating payroll. So actually, the easier way to do it that happens to be more accurate is static allocations of payroll based on somebody's job description in an ideal, realistic scenario. Because the reality is, if you were hired as a designer at a firm, chances are 100% of your job in a perfect scenario is to work on delivery work and then have whatever necessary amount of internal meetings and internal process are required to support that job. So um, yeah, the, the long and short of this is, I'm not saying it's not useful to have insight into where internal time is going. That's obviously very useful, but it's a bonus. It's not the most important thing, which is really understanding is the work we're doing fundamentally profitable. And I would argue that internal time tracking is not necessary for financial insight into how much we're spending on the PL in those areas of the business. And it's, it's actually a less accurate way to do it, despite being significantly more precise. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, so we have another question here, Marcel. What have your success rates been in agencies using your methodology and what has feedback been from agencies? Yeah. So uh, the success rate in terms of improving timesheet compliance has been very high. I would say over 90% of the clients that have spent enough time with us to actually like get this flywheel spinning in their business. What we've seen is that time tracking compliance goes up, buy-in from the team goes up and over enough time, the team starts learning how to use this data to make informed decisions. And that's the beautiful thing about this is that we have a couple of clients where as a leadership team, they're no longer a bottleneck in improving the profitability of the agency because the team now understands how this works. So their you know, department managers are able to take this information, sit with their team, have a discussion, and they're all coming up with their own ideas on how can we improve things? How can we tighten up this process? How can we, you know, rectify how long it takes to do this thing. And I can share actually a little bit, something I didn't share earlier, but I think is worth sharing because Productive is one of the few platforms that can do this well, is like the one most important conversation you could have with your team around this data. And that conversation has to do with uh, what we call average billable rate. So okay. of all the metrics that are really simple and easy to use to understand like what's going well and what's not going well in the business, average billable rate is that conversation. Uh, and actually, sorry, I'm gonna share my screen the traditional way again, just to make sure everyone can see it. Great. There we go, okay. So this is such a simple, but such a powerful metric where what we do is we take the agency gross income of a project, which is how much we got paid after we remove pass-through expenses. So in this website build, let's say, for example, we got paid $70,000, but we paid a development firm that's external $20,000 to do some work on this project. So what's left over after that is $50,000. That's the real revenue of that project to us as an agency. And then we spent 500 hours to earn $50,000. And keep in mind that it doesn't matter how we build for this. We build by the hour, we build a flat rate, we build on value, we build in sprints, we got paid in tried it lenders, doesn't matter. We collected this amount of money and we invested this amount of time. And so we have an efficiency heuristic here. 
for every hour that we invested, this is how much money that we made. So this metric is really cool because you could compare anything to anything in the business. You could compare clients, you could compare projects, you could compare departments, and you can do it for any time period. You could look at a week, a month, a quarter, a year, it doesn't matter. So this is an example of doing this by project. And again, Productive is one of the few platforms I've seen where you could actually tool this up right inside of the system without having to build this data set in a spreadsheet, which I think is pretty cool. So imagine you sit down with your team and you just have a conversation about what sticks out to you on this report. Mm -hmm. Well, what sticks out to me is that this funnel build was twice as efficient at earning us revenue than the website was. So I'd be focused on this and I'd be asking, what can we learn from this? This went obviously really well. The client was pleased. What is it about these funnel builds that's really efficient? Is there anything we can learn from this to apply to the other work that we do? Another thing that sticks out to me is that the thing that most people would think is the most profitable project because it paid us so much money was actually the least efficient at earning us revenue. So I might be asking, hey, was there something that we missed when we scoped this? Was there something about the client that we didn't expect? Was there something that went wrong in our process or a mistake that was made that we can learn from? And I'd be really asking the team for their feedback on like, what do you think is going on here so that we can ladder that up into insights? Of all the reports and conversations that you can start with and use your time tracking data to facilitate, to me, this is the easiest and the most powerful and can really start to get the gears turning with your team on, oh, okay, this is why this time tracking information is important. This is how it's being used to really try and get some insight into what's going on. Sure, sure. It's not not to micromanage, like, where did your week go? Why did this take too long? It's really to to see how the business can grow better in the future. That's exactly right. And what you just mentioned, I think is one of the biggest mistakes that people make is even if you go into a conversation like this with good intentions, it becomes a disciplinary conversation. So we have to be very careful about, you know, on that website build, we're not saying, hey, you went over the budget and we didn't do well financially on this project. The way you frame that conversation has to be very deliberate. It's like we like this project we're all on the same side of the table and we're looking at the project together did not go the way that we expected. What yeah. can we learn from that? That's sure. the way we have to frame that conversation. And the other thing is as a leader, you might already know what the problem was, but you can't just come into that meeting and dictate that to, to your team. You really have to invite them to come forward with their ideas because if it starts to feel like a disciplinary conversation, everyone's right. going to check out. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another question from the crowd. How do you anticipate the unexpected situations that delay deadlines? Do you include it in the time tract or do you estimate it from the beginning? Yeah. Okay. So how do you anticipate to share and draw again? <laughs> delay deadlines. Do you include it in the time tract or do you estimate? It? So of course you want to try to estimate this stuff from the beginning as much as possible. And this is where I could go on a whole other tangent about why scoping and pricing are related but separate exercises. I think I, I one of the biggest mistakes I see agencies make around pricing and scoping is they intrinsically link those ideas together. So they can't change the price without changing the hours. But like that's problematic because those two things are not actually linked to one another. So yes, try to anticipate that as much as you can upfront. But as it happens, then you need to track what's actually happening so that at the end you can get real feedback. So this is another big mistake that I see people make is they'll run an average billable rate report like this and they'll do it based on billable hours as opposed to delivery hours. So that's problematic because let's say on this project you build for 400 hours, but you actually spent 500, but you build for 400 because yeah, we screwed something up or you know we made a mistake or we didn't manage the scope properly and we gave the client a bunch of free stuff, but we didn't bill them for it. That's a really important insight. But if we try to measure this against the 400 hours that we build for, we're not gonna see the truth of the matter. So hopefully that answers your question, which is you wanna scope things as accurately as possible and try to articulate the reality. What do you really expect this to take from a cost and time investment? The price is separate, but related. And then let's measure what actually happened. And that reality is what really helps us as a team make better decisions because it's not changing the price or the scope for the client. But when we're not clear about those things, we start to trick ourselves into thinking that things are you know, going worse than we planned for them to go. When in reality, we set ourselves up in the beginning for failure. Sure. Um, next question. 
I'm considering moving from a weekly to daily timekeeping policy. With weekly, our mm. compliance is not great and, I, and entries are inaccurate. What's your opinion? Yeah, of course, daily time tracking is better if you can accomplish it. But in my experience, trying to hold everyone to that standard is really, really challenging. And ultimately, if you're not getting good compliance, I think that there is a deeper issue that you need to tap into. Um, from my experience, like the more important thing is, like I said earlier, getting everybody to understand why it's being done and actually getting involved in how those conversations happen around the data. And this kind of sounds crazy, but if you're having time tracking compliance issues, start having these meetings using the bad data. And the reason that that's so powerful is you sit down and you go, guys, um, oh my God, this is incredible. We spent half as much time on this project as we thought we were going to. That means I can sell twice as many next month and you guys still won't be too busy. And somebody yeah. will raise their hand and go, whoa, whoa, hold up boss. I, I actually didn't track a whole bunch of time to that. And you're like, oh, well, I mean, that's a problem because this is like, this is how I'm interpreting the data. I, I can't know that unless you put your time in. So start using the reports with the bad data on purpose and play, you know, the fool. And immediately your team will start to realize like, oh, if I lie on my timesheets, there's a bad outcome that doesn't serve me there. So hopefully that it serves. If you can get people to track daily, great, but I wouldn't try to enforce that without really digging into the underlying issues behind why people aren't doing it in the first place. And then generally, you can let people be more autonomous about how they track time. And a tool like Productive is great because it gives everybody there a, a way to figure out how to do it that works for them. People might do it differently, but what's important is at the end of the day, everybody gets it in. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that question. Um, next question, as we charge hours, and that is our main revenue, uh, should we be worried to lose time track data on in productive? Uh, can we export Excel backup? Okay, I think uh, this is more of a technical question. I am keeping a parallel timesheet, but maybe we can you can reassure me. Yeah, um, please. Um, there, this is an anonymous question. Please feel free to reach out. Um, just respond to any of the uh, emails that we you got sent for the webinar, and I'll get back to you right after uh, right after the webinar. Another question that we had. Uh, how do you see capacity of a person if they aren't tracking internal time? Mm, this is a great question, Borna. Thank you for asking that. So first and foremost, the capacity of somebody's time can be modeled outside of um, can be modeled outside of a time tracking tool, right? So my capacity as an employee for for a regular job is forty hours per week. It's two thousand and eighty hours per year. And then of course, there's a bunch of things that are going to get removed from that. I'm going to take some vacation time. There's going to be some holidays. You're going to have some sick days baked in there. Maybe we're going to spend two days a month or two days a quarter doing annual planning. And then maybe I have internal responsibilities. So I am responsible for, I don't know, keeping the company website up to date. So all of those things we can extract from my capacity so that on a weekly basis, I'm not expected to work 40 billable hours on you know, client delivery time. I might only be expected to work 28 billable hours. And so when we resource plan, to your point, you can schedule or plan for that internal time. But I think it's really important, this, this is a whole other webinar, but it's really important to zoom out and consider what is the model for our agency? Because I see this happen all the time where we start scheduling a whole bunch of internal time without considering what is the cost of that and how aligned is that to our model as a business? Because you need to have a certain level of utilization in order to be profitable. But if you just start booking people for a whole bunch of internal time and then they're not capable of hitting their utilization target, you're setting them up for failure. So hopefully, Borna, that answers your question. Capacity is modeled independently of time tracked. And for internal time, you want to model that into their delivery capacity. Um, you would never expect, I don't think anyone to work 40 billable hours a week, unless you're really assuming that they're going to work more than 40 hours a week. And you've agreed on that already. Yeah. Thanks. Can Marshall suggests a go-to dashboard with reports for effective time tracking. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> Marshall has already uh, suggested, you know, productive great for time tracking. If you want to test it out, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll set you up yep. with our team with a demo. That'd be, that'd be lovely. 
Yes, uh, I, send- I will say that productive is one of the better tools that I've seen in terms of being able to report on the metrics that I believe are important for agencies to measure. But I will say, and excuse me if this is controversial, Maria, that that dashboard doesn't really exist because these metrics are compound and they're complex. And for most people, you can't source all the data from one platform to do all of your reporting. And I think like if you look at every other industry, especially if you go out market, no one is expecting the place that they collect all of their data to be the place that they do their reporting. That would actually be bad practice uh, from a data management perspective. You want to have an intermediate layer because the data is not going to be perfect. It's going to need transformation, normalization, cleaning. You're going to change the schema over time. So if you just think about like well understood best practice for data management, it's not to try and couple those things into one system. Nobody would architect that in an enterprise system. So we probably shouldn't be thinking about it that way at our level. With that said, if you're thinking about time tracking data and getting just visibility into that data, and you're not thinking about these broader, more complex, complex metrics, uh, Productive is by far one of the best tools that I've seen for that and has way more flexibility in terms of reporting and can do a lot. So that would be my first suggestion. And then I would argue, look at building an ETL framework if you want to have a, a dashboard, but understand that it's never going to be automated. That's not possible for this kind of reporting. And you're going to need to have a data management practice that includes having a middle step where you do quality assurance, transformation, normalization, stitching of your data before you then load it into wherever you're going to visualize it. Yeah. Um, So uh, for those of you who don't know, like we have like around uh, 50 pre-built reports that are concerning agencies. Maybe this is like linked to the next question uh, by Bruno. What what are the most important relevant KPIs for high-level managers to look at? So through Productive, you can access uh, a lot of those reports, but also build your own ones. But, you know, as as Marcel mentioned at the beginning, like you can't just uh, share a report with your team and expect them to know how to read the data. Like you really have to put the pieces together yourself and conversation to make everything coherent, really. Uh, what are the most important relevant KPIs for high level managers to look at? Um, yeah. Want to answer that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from my perspective, there's, th- there's three, there's one really important one financially, which is delivery margin. I don't know that we necessarily have time to like dig all the way into that, but I'll give you all a resource that you can go deeper into. But if we think about operationally, which I think is the most relevant for the conversation we're having today, there's three. And they're the three numbers that influence your profitability as a firm or your fundamental profitability as a firm, I should say. These are what we call our three delivery margin levers, which I will illustrate using this very crooked triangle that I just drew. Can I rotate this? Yeah, I can. There we go. Okay. Order is restored. So the first one is average cost per hour, which is really a proxy for delivery costs. So if you look at a given project, what was the average cost of every hour that was spent doing that project? And that's going to give you a good sense of where are more expensive or more senior people spending a lot of their time. And you can start to get an understanding of like, are there things that are much more expensive for us to deliver because it requires more expensive people to do that kind of work and identify opportunities where you might be able to lower your average cost per hour by creating better process, having better systems, better technology, better documentation. So you can ultimately lower the level of judgment required to do that work and thereby lower the cost of doing that work. And if you use a lot of freelancers or contractors, you'll feel that profitability improvement very quickly because there's not a lot of latency between when the work gets done and when you pay for it. If you have a team that will play out over a longer time horizon as the composition of your team becomes less top heavy as you scale, because you don't need as much time from those expensive people. This is my least favorite of the three key metrics. The other two are average billable rate, which we talked about earlier. This measures for, on average, for every hour that we spend doing work for clients, how much revenue do we earn as a company? Again, this does not mean billing by the hour. This is normalized across all billing models. And this can really, like I talked about earlier, help you identify opportunities where it's like, hey, we need to investigate why we're not very efficient here and improve process, or we need to investigate why we're so efficient here and what we can learn from it, or we need to sell more of this thing. Because if you think about it this way, if you have 5,000 hours of capacity in a month to sell, would you rather sell those hours for 200 or $100 an hour? 
it seems too simple to be true, but you could literally double the amount of money that your company makes if you sold things that were more efficient at earning you revenue. Think about that for a second. So average billable rate is super powerful and there are two ways to improve it. You can raise your price. That's great, obvious, easy, maybe not, especially not right now. The other way to do it though, is you spend less time to do the same thing. And that can have the same effect, right? If you can spend half as much time to do something, you do twice as much. So average billable rates, the second one. And then the last one for managers, especially, I don't like this metric for the team, the ICs, because they don't control it. But for managers, this is critical, is utilization, right? And again, productive is one of the few platforms where you can configure it to measure utilization properly, which is based on capacity, not based on time tracked. Utilization measures how much of the time that we have available from the team is utilized for delivery work or for doing work for clients. And so it's really important to use this measure to give yourself feedback on how good are we at balancing our staff and the work that's coming into the business. And the big mistake I see people make with utilization is they go to their ICs, like they go to a designer and they're like, I need you to improve your utilization. The problem is your designer has no control over their utilization. They don't get to decide how many projects you sold and they don't get to decide how many designers you hire or fire in a given period. So this is your responsibility as a manager, not your team's responsibility to keep this number high. And if they're getting work done faster than you expected with less time, that's a good thing. You don't want to penalize them for that. That's why with the team, I focus on ABR because it rewards efficiency, which in a modern agency, that's not purely billing by the hour. That's a positive thing that we want to be rewarding. So hopefully that answers the question. Great. Uh, we're just going to wrap up with one max, two more questions, but yeah, we're coming to an end here. Um, I think this question, how do you motivate your team to adopt time tracking is really what you spoke about. Um, if you want to elaborate any, you know, with any additional methods or, you know, as you said, you have to frame the conversation kind of, um, yeah. there's some soft, soft ways to get in. And I mean, you, you've talked about a lot of them, gamification, ambient accountability. So like actually publishing a scoreboard that everyone can see of who's tracking their time and who's not, those things can be very effective, but as I kind of mentioned earlier, like the most important thing is closing the loop and just like showing them the data, showing them how it impacts the way that you have to think as a manager and the interpretation that you have of that data when it's not there is the most important thing. And then everything else is gravy, right? Making it easier, making it transparent, having good reporting, those automated pulse reports, like all of those things can be really nice improvements, but without that underlying connection of the dots, it's much harder. Yeah, I can answer these last two quickly if you sure. want. Sure, sure. Okay. So Juan is asking precision versus accuracy, basically. So we have some people that track really, really precise time with timers. We have other people that track it in broader buckets. Um, what are my thoughts on these different styles and should we encourage both? So Juan, from my perspective, having those two styles happening is not a problem. And I think that trying to force people to be more precise sounds like it's going to be better, but it will likely actually hurt your compliance and therefore not be a bonus. So I don't, I don't see it as a problem. If people want to be precise, that's great, but there's a really good chance that those bulk time trackers are still going to be directionally accurate. And the thing that I'd be more focused on is what percentage of time is being captured. Because again, I'd rather have 90 or 95% of delivery time being captured and having it be 60 or 70% precise, because that will still give me an accurate lens into what's going on. I'll still be able to get a sense of where are we going over, where are we going under, and that informs better decision-making rather than have 60% of the time ending up in the time tracking tool and have it be 90% precise. That is a far less useful set of data in my opinion. So hopefully that helps one is don't overthink the way it's being tracked, just focus on getting people to get it in there. And then lastly, utilization for a developer, designer, practitioner. Generally, we see a target of between 75 and 90% per week, and you're gonna take 10 to 20% of that off per year to account for time off, vacation time, holidays, et cetera. So you need to take a look at where you live, what kind of time off policies you have. If you're in Europe, it's probably closer to 20%. If you're in the US, it's probably closer to 10. If you're somewhere like Canada, it's probably somewhere in the middle. Um, but that's kind of the, the weekly versus annual target you're gonna take 10 to 20% off of that. So 
the other thing to think about Borna is what is your uh, client dilution? If a developer works on one or two projects at a time, they're probably going to be 90% utilized and they're not going to be that stressed about it. But if you have a developer that has to work on six different clients at a time, they might be at 75% and be really stressed. So client dilution is a huge driver of how high you can push a utilization target and how burnt out people will feel simultaneously. Sure. Wow, this was like a great Q&A. Uh, thanks so much <laughs> for submitting your questions. If yeah. you have anything else you want to ask Marcel, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'm not going to share my screen for the thank you slide. I'm just going to say thanks to everyone. If you have any questions, again, regarding productive, the tool, how to get something out of it, uh, let me know. If you need a demo because you've never used it, feel free to reach out. Marcel is here to answer any more questions you have for him. Um, yeah. Yeah. On that note, Maria, if you don't mind, for those that do have questions after the webinar, here's my email. You can just reach right out to me. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. And if you want to go learn more about all of the metrics that you should be tracking in your agency, go deeper on how to implement time tracking and some of the things I talked about, we have a free toolkit at parakeeto.com forward slash toolkit with training videos, templates, cheat sheets, all kinds of free tools that'll help you go deeper into what we talked about today. Great. Thanks to everyone and have a good day. Anyone who has a day in front of them and a good evening to anyone else <laughs> from Europe.